Good evening. My name is Ilko Bos van Rosenthal. I'll be the moderator for tonight's session. Um, a very warm welcome at the fourth installment of our series called The Many Faces of Modern China, brought to you by the Bali here in Amsterdam and the Leiden Asia Center. In this series, we discuss um, various um, um, views on Chinese development, its expansion militarily, politically, culturally. In previous episodes, we looked at China's economy, its political system, its rise on the international stage. And tonight, we will be discussing the current US strategy towards China. How does the US, uh, in a new Biden administration, look at Beijing and the other way around? And what are the implications for Europe and the East Asian region? Um, at the end of this evening, there will be room for questions, obviously, that is in about an hour. You can easily send any question you have um, uh, via the Slido uh, system. The code will appear below on your screen. That's in about an hour. Um, until then, we'll have a discussion with four uh, guests, and we're very happy to have three of them here in the Bali and one of them um, via Zoom uh, here present as well. So let me introduce our panel for tonight. Uh, Matt Virgin, China expert and the head of global China research at Merix, the Mercator Institute, the renowned uh, China Institute in Berlin. Uh, Agnes Jongerius, member of the European Parliament for the Labour Party. Uh, Thies Dams, uh, writer, China expert at the Klingendal Institute. A warm welcome to all three of you. And in Cambridge in the UK is Kuchin, Quinchin Lin. I tried. Um, academic at Cambridge University, the deputy director of the Center for Geopolitics. A warm welcome to you as well. Um, well, we're used to it by now. No audience uh, here. Um, audiences at home, uh, one um, a panel member um, in Cambridge, he will wave whenever he has a question or he wants to bring something uh, into this discussion. Um, and let's make it a lively uh, discussion about mostly US-China relationship and what is Europe's position in that as well. Um, and I'd like to start with the US perspective, since the past few years were obviously um, pretty dramatic with a trade war um, between uh, Washington and Beijing. Um, obviously, the COVID uh, pandemic, the Trump administration that, that kept calling it the China virus, uh, and everything that happened. Um, and I'd like to start with you, Matt. The, the, the Obama administration ended in 2016. The Trump administration started. Um, the, the, the Trump saw China no longer as a strategic partner, but as a strategic a competitor. The, the language, the, the rhetoric obviously changed. What was the, besides the rhetoric, the, the big change in 16 or, or 17 when it was inaugurated between the Obama and the Trump administrations? I think the Trump administration gave vent to a sense of frustration. A lot of what you saw in the Trump administration was a sense that US-China policy had failed. It, it, it had been uh, patient in an effort to try to achieve US goals, whether that was on trade or military issues in the South China Sea, whatever issue it was, there was a sense that there had been dialogue after dialogue, conversation after conversation, and that the US had, at least under the Trump administration, determined that that approach was no longer going to be viable, and that in some sense, the nature of China itself had changed. The idea that China might become more liberal economic, economically or politically, goals or expectations that the US had had under many administrations, that there was just a sense of frustration that that period had ended, that something maybe essentially about China itself had changed, and that the U.S. needed to take a different approach. And so what you saw then was a variety of policies that flowed from that, including the framing of the relationship in much different terms than you had seen before. The Trump administration basically found the Obama administration naive when it came it to It wasn't just, China. I mean, the language of the Trump administration was essentially that U.S. China policy had failed, maybe, maybe even going back to the, the Nixon-Kissinger years. Right. Did they have a point? Or is that too I, broad a question? Well, let's just say this. I think they, it was astute 
politically in the sense that it gave vent to a lot of frustrations in the business community among those concerned about human rights, uh, military, a sense that the, the US military had been bogged down in longstanding wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and had sort of lost the focus on what the priorities were. So there was a great deal of political support among different groups that the Trump team tapped into. Um, I think there were a variety of mistakes that were made, and we can talk about that later. And I think the, the Biden administration also sensed that there were some missteps in terms of not just identifying the problems, but then actually tackling them, tackling them in some effective way. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it, it, Trump's rhetoric was obviously different, um, but it's compared to some other foreign policy issues in Washington, it's a pretty bipartisan issue, or at least it seems to be, um, U.S. policy towards China. Would you it's, agree? I'm, I, Democrats and Republicans don't agree right. on much, but... I think there's certainly a sense that the former consensus about sort of working with China in some way, and China would change if the U.S. Um, continued to, to engage, that that consensus has certainly gone away. There's a lot of talk in Washington about bipartisan consensus. I think if you scratch beneath the surface, you see there are a lot of different approaches, uh, even if we just think of you know, climate engagement, for example and what that should look like. Um, we do see new bills in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, for example, has just come up with a, a new bill that's very China-focused, and this is, there's an emphasis on bipartisan cooperation there. But I think this is also being sold. Whenever we're told there's a consensus, I at least alarm bells go off for me. Um, there are a lot of issues that have not been explored in much depth, either in terms of what What's the real problem on the economic front, on the security front, on the human rights front, on all these issues, I would say if you dig a little bit beneath the surface, you'll see there's not necessarily so much to the consensus, either in terms of what the real problem is or what especially should be done about it. Okay, we'll, we'll get to talk about that a lot further. Uh, thank, thank you for now. Achtens Jongerius, the, 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 the Trump administration versus China, Europe, the European Union has basically stood on the sidelines watching, in a sense. As a member of the European Parliament, how have you um, looked at that over the past few years, at that relation? No, it, it was uh, indeed a little bit worrying uh, because uh, there were two uh, big uh, uh, continents fighting one another and Europe was just in between. Uh, and Europe was also doubting which position they uh, should take because on the one hand, I think it was in the year 2003 that they declared China as our strategic partner. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 2019, uh, uh, it was of, uh, 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 for sudden foreseen as uh, the, the biggest uh, uh, threat uh, uh, for a uh, European economy because like tariffs in the steel sector were really, uh, was really hurting, this, this fight was really hurting uh, uh, the uh, European steel uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, steel uh, sector, uh, and what I but I think we're going to talk about is uh, later. Uh, uh, instead of waiting uh, to the change uh, uh, of the uh, administration in uh, uh, in the United States, at the last day of her presidency, uh, Angela Merkel all of the sudden. And made an agreement with the Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which was also a big investment uh, uh, agreement. A big investment yeah. agreement. So first, it's our ally, then mm -hmm. it's our biggest threat, and then all of a sudden, uh, between the election of Biden uh, and his mm -hmm. uh, uh, start in office, mm -hmm. we making a solo trip, which right. is also strange. You are right. We will get to talk about that yeah. um, that uh, deal, which now seems to be stalled a little bit uh, in in a moment. Uh, we go to Cambridge, Mr. Lin. Do you see any? Um, has the Trump administration's four years in office, when it comes to China, um, has that been harmful for the most, or do, do you consider it having been a setback, or is it also uh, also the harsh rhetoric uh, a blessing in disguise, in a way? Thank you. Um, well, let me go back first to uh, Matt's um, points, and I'll add a few things to that before so I offer a, a, an assessment. So I very much agree with what Matt has said. I, I think two divisions were crossed during the Trump administration, two divides. And I think one thing is a recognition that the, the so-called China model, right, the way that China has run its high-growth uh, economy, was unsustainable 
However, the impact, I mean, we always knew that, that there were problems with it, right? But we were happy to let the Chinese run their own business as long as that they were, you know, helping us along with global economy and, and our consumers' preferences. But the impact can no longer be isolated. And this is most obviously seen in climate change. So I remember 10 years ago when I started teaching at Cambridge, I used to tell, to tell my students, you know, look, the Americans and the Chinese are pretty much neck to neck as, you know, major contributor to carbon emissions globally. Well, today China is contributing 27% to global carbon emissions, and America 11%. So a lot has changed. So just a, just a sheer scale of China's economy nowadays is going to make huge impacts on everyone, ranging from currency to trade, you know, to financial market stability to climate change. So that's one thing that has, you know, I think in America uh, discourse, we, we crossed over, we begin to recognize the effect of China is not only contained inwards. Another divide we've crossed over which I think is a more profound one, is the so-called market and state division, which is intrinsic to neoclassical economics. So this is the ideology of the 1980s, right? The market should you know, handle itself. It has its own equilibrium. The state has its own things, right? Um, but in terms of looking at examining industrial policy, which I think started under Obama, but certainly you know, very salient uh, reviews of China, uh, Chinese you know, competitiveness and American competitiveness in, industri in various industries, especially with telecom, it shows that there's no longer a possibility of keeping these two realms separate. So we talk about sort of, you know, interdependence, weaponization, you know, especially in technology realms. So these devices, once you sort of cognitively can cross over that, right, the nation state, the China should stay where it is, uh, and, and also the market and the governments are different realms. Once you cross over, then there's a lot of things that you need to sort of, you know, sort out and think about, including our relationship to our allies. Um, so my sort of answer to your uh, question, the first answer is that um, it, around the world, and especially in Asia, I would say that Trump's policy has been treated with a lot of respect. And the reason is that because the logic that I've just described to you and Matt has referred to is often recognized by a lot of Asian countries when they deal with China themselves. And as sort of economies, you know, for example, I was born in Taiwan, um, I mean, we recognize what it means to have a state-dominated economy and the influence on the private sector. All these things are sort of intrinsic to our understanding of the world. So to have America sort of recognize and deal with it directly is very important. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of Trump's handling of the relationship to allies, which has been you know, often criticized, here the question is also very important because a lot of Asians also tend to see Trump in more favorable, favorable light than for perhaps you know, we're, we, we assess Trump here in Europe, is that... Um, we, we recognize that Americans have sort of contributed a lot to Asian stability, but that contribution is not stable. Mm. So one of the problems is the idea of hedging, right? So secondary powers often hedge. They, you know, they, they choose America for one thing and choose China for economic development or whatever. And that's no longer working, right? Because once you cross over the market state division, you recognize that if China were to invest in your, I don't know, critical infrastructure, right, telecom it will have a security effect. You cannot separate out these realms. And so this is something that um, the Trump administration has recognized, and I, I think you know, it's, it's dealing with it in its own way, in its very insular, so American-centric way, mm -hmm. but it has broader implications. Mm -hmm. So this is what leads us to, to, to assessment, I think, you know, of um, the so-called Cold War 2.0. And I'm not saying that's a good way to see things. There's a lot of discourse on this right now. But we're basically, and the fact that America recognizes that uh, it's dealing with uh, a country that has the ambition of the Soviet Union, but it's run on a hybrid engine, if I may call it so, you know, of state capitalism that's far more effective and powerful than pure command economy, is a genuine threat. And this is something that's known to the Asians for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so this is something I think will has, has to be taken into account. So it, it, you know, it's not just the politics of Trump. It, I think it's the overall reorientation of America, which is being, you know, sort of... Uh, understood around the world, and, yeah. and it has positive aspects, if I may say. Pre President Trump basically spoke the language that, that many uh, Asian partners wanted to hear. In, in many ways, well, at least con it's congruent yeah. with the, the, the trends in Australia, you know, Taiwan, Japan, and elsewhere now for right. many years. Right. Does that also mean these dumps um, that there, and we'll get to talk about now the Biden approach in, in a second, but that there's 
there's no way back to, for instance, the, the softer Obama stance on China. I mean, with, with Trump, we entered a new era in a sense. Yes, and, and, and I think, um, uh, I mean, it takes a next step with Biden because he ups the ideological ante. He says there's a big ideological confrontation between these authoritarian state led by China and, and, and a concert, hopefully a concert of democracies um, in which uh, America has a role to play. And, and, and Trump didn't do that. He didn't play that ideological card that hard because he wasn't that ideological motivated himself. Um, uh, but he uh, opened the door for that sort of uh, confrontational stance towards China. Um, and, and I think Biden fills that gap with his own kind of rhetoric. Um, but it's it's the the the, the door was opened, uh, or further opened by by Trump. Uh, but I think, as Matt has also said, it began a little bit before that. I mean, Obama had his pivot to Asia. Even George W. Bush, before his um, uh, presidencies, became all about the war on terror and, and the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, the in, first few months of the Bush administration. Exactly. He, he put China on top of the foreign sure. policy agenda. So it, it's been a long time in the making. It wasn't about Trump, but Trump certainly gave an important push. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and did he, and did in, in, in a sense, did Trump get what he wanted during those four years? Well, no, I mean, he didn't get what he promised. He said he would uh, fundamentally alter the, the parameters of the economic relationship but by, between China and, and the US, and particularly this, the, the, the trade deficit that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. um, but he did have an enormous impact on uh, uh, the rhetoric and the narratives uh, surrounding these, this, this great power relationship. And I mean, we started with separating so policy from rhetoric, but rhetoric's policy too. And, sure. and in that way, he's been immensely uh, influential. But the, the thing he promised to do, tackle the trade deficit. That, but that you could happen. also say that the rhetoric didn't change. So if the, if the rhetoric didn't work, uh, so if it didn't break the chains in the economic uh, uh, relationship between the two, um, right. Well, can, can you call it successful then, or uh, should you say, okay, uh, nice for internal consumption? Uh, people liked uh, 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 Trump uh, going after the Chinese, but well, I think it was successful in, in, in at least um, getting rid of a part of that consensus that Matt so so uh, 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 illustrated so good. Um, uh, uh, that consensus of we can still work with China to change China. So in, I think in a... In so a, that idea is history, basically. Yeah, and uh, Trump was pretty good at, at changing that. Um, yeah. He yeah. wasn't going to change the tra trade deficit anyway, so... The, the, yeah. Isn't the big difference also that for, for Trump, foreign policy or China policy or any policy is a, is a zero-sum game, right? It's either win or lose and there's nothing in between. Well, they, I mean, one of his lead... Uh, advisors, Peter Navarro, right. literally had written a book called Death by China. So there was this... The most ha hawkish right. China guy. By the end of the administration, the, 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 the Trump team, even as on its way out the door, was saying one of our proudest, best achievements was you know, letting the American people know, but letting the world know that China is an existential threat, um, using some of that language. Uh, the, the Biden administration and the team, I think, has tried to change that somewhat subtly and change the framing to really focus on competition. That's the language you see suffusing the Biden administration team, this idea of Instead extreme of threats, competition. It's compatible. So moving away from this idea, because then you do have, if, it's, if China is an existential threat, then you must treat it as such, uh, you know, both ideologically, but in, with all of the means that you have, you, you must then deal with China that way. And I think this, this rhetorical shift to competition, and it's not just competition, and we can get into this when it's sort of the, how the, the European and the, um, mm -hmm. the American framing or balance of framing lines up, but competition, I think, is the, the way that the Biden mm. team has kept a lot of the so we need to be, we need to take a strong stance and understand the challenges and threats from China. Right. But, but let's, instead of focusing on the existential threat part of it, let's get our own house in order, let's work with allies, let's do all the things we need to do to compete effectively. Right. But uh, wouldn't, you, yeah. wouldn't you agree that um, aside from changing the existential threat discourse to uh, competition, um, uh, Biden has also taken on a far more ideological kind of story about China, about this, this confrontation between authoritarian regimes and democracies worldwide that does have an existential threat kind of feel to it. I mean, right, that is very much Harry Potter. Uh, the, the, we, the, they cannot, the one cannot survive while the other one lives. Right. Um, we have a, yeah, you wanted to make a point. 
Mr. Lin. Uh, yes, very quickly to Tyus's is um, two points. Uh, one on the existential threat. I mean, just keep in mind that uh, Mike Pompeo obviously has played up this ideological dimension mm -hmm. and, you know, even Christianity versus, you know, right, uh, quite a bit. So it, it's not, the Trump administration is not entirely devoid of that dimension of human rights and um, democracy. But the second point about the trade policy having failed, you know, I, I think that's it's too early to judge that. Um, in 2019, before the COVID uh, hit, uh, there there was significant evidence that actually this whole restructuring of the global supply chain was in fact beginning to take place. So countries like Vietnam and India and even Pakistan, Bangladesh, all, all benefited from capturing a greater share of the you know exports to America, and then they they were ramping up their productions and you know interesting things were happening. And then of course COVID hit, right? And it, the, the result was that not only was you know, American European demand depressed, that there was this whole bottleneck in the global container shipping industry, which basically choked off um, exports from these countries in favor of China. So the fact that the trade deficit seems to have actually grown over this past year is not an indication of the effect of the trade policy. It's more of an indication of the effect of COVID uh, of the industrial bottlenecks, the, the collapse of the Chinese demand was very important in the first half year of 2020. So essentially, import declines. So of course, export didn't have to go up very high to create, gen, you know, to generate higher deficit against uh, America. Oh, sorry, against China, right? U.S. deficit. So I mean, I, I think all these factors are very important, and I think the Biden administration recognizes that. That's why um, Janet Yellen hasn't really said, okay, look, we're going to completely, you know, change our approach. And in fact, you know, Catherine Tai recently, the new USTR, um, is talking about a thorough review before she makes any decision on any, you know, lifting any sanctions. Right. When, when you mentioned the, um, when you mentioned Matt China being a co competitor in, in every way, um, you know, technologically, trade, military, etc. I suppose there isn't a, a fit for all policy or one strategy that covers all those those areas, right? Is, is, is there one area um, uh, of which you could say, you know, th this is where Chinese-U.S. cooperation may work? Well, the things that seem to fit into the cooperation basket uh, are climate, right. maybe health. Uh, but even interestingly on climate, I think we will see more mm -hmm. happening, including at the EU, China, U.S. level, uh, where we see something that we might call cooperation as we get closer to the COP26 climate meetings in Glasgow later this year. Mm -hmm. um, but even on the climate talks, what you see a lot of is a discussion about uh, how the U.S. needs to be competitive in climate technology, in green technology, um, and that the 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 place that needs to be competed against or who's going to have an industrial policy of its own that the U.S. needs to be concerned about and compete against is China. Mm -hmm. So you have administration officials saying there's this massive market for green technology globally in the trillions, and if we don't get it, we Americans don't, don't get it and capture that market, mm -hmm. then the Chinese will. But obviously this is a, this is a tricky issue for U.S., Europe, China cooperation too, because if the U.S. government is prioritizing industrial policy and government support for technology and firms um, and sectors, then there are question marks about whether or not that is a challenge equally for, for other countries and where the cooperation part really, really can work. Right, right. Do you see other, um, these other, um, uh, other areas of cooperation besides climate and, and perhaps the next pandemic, health? I mean, human rights, I guess, is, is and trade are maybe the most out of the question. polemic <laughs> issues. Yeah, um, I would be hard. Uh, <laughs> that, that's a that's a difficult question. I don't think. I mean, I I, I agree with Matt. I I I I would find it easier to list issues uh, arising in the what now seem relatively promising areas of cooperation than right. uh, anything else. I mean, between Europe and China, um, there's, for instance, talk uh, also in, in the follow-up of the the investment agreement that we touched upon earlier of, of a greater convergence in um, uh, financial markets, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all kinds of, um, and, and of course, a trade and trade links. Um, uh, but none of that is, is I think, an, it can be seen as 
uh, as, a, as a probably separate domain from the geopolitical tensions right. that, that will dominate any of them. Right. Mr. Lin, you raise your hand. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think there's a, a more immediate deliverable and, and one a, a sort of slightly a medium-term uh, area of cooperation. So let me start with the medium term. I actually think there's a lot of work to be done on less developed countries that U.S. and China can work together. Right? So we're not talking about having a U.S. matching fund to the Belt and Road Initiative or the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Right? That's ridiculous. You know, the Americans will never come up with you know, enough money to match the Chinese. But there are areas where they can both work together. Right? So, for example, in Pakistan, one of the most interesting cases, obviously, you know, Pakistan is the flagship of BRI, it's taking you know, a lion's share of the investment. And when the Pakistani are having issues, you know, sort of repaying the Chinese, the Chinese had no problem with them going to the IMF and getting you know, sort of bridge loans to help them to move on. And so there are areas where America and China have to recognize that they, they could work together for, for the global south. So that's a also a more medium-term objective. But I think the, in the short run, they, and then this is sort of you know, perhaps surprisingly, America and China can work on military areas. So, for example, space, right? This is the next, you know, sort of big domain. And in space, there is not really any kind of rules or constitutions or charters that countries can agree on. But this is a sphere where it's, you know, expanding commercial opportunities. You've seen the SpaceX, you know, various efforts. Um, a lot of countries are getting in the act, you know, uh, including Saudi Arabia, India, and others. And this is an area that's going to have major impact on, you know, our communications and various other aspects of, you know, uh, daily lives. And this is something that China and, and, and U.S. could talk about. Uh, for example, the issues of debris. Right? There are lots of space debris floating around. You know, issues of satellites getting too close to each other. So that's equivalent to the maritime code of conduct, right? You know, how to deal with these issues. Um, so that's something that America as a, a sort of, you know, past hegemon in the realm, um, and China as a sort of aspiring, you know, space power, um, have a lot to discuss. Okay, health, climate, and space. We're, we're getting somewhere um, <laughs> on a positive note. Let's talk about Europe. And you mentioned the investment accord that was uh, made after Biden was elected, I think before he was inaugurated. On the, on the 31st of uh, December. Of the December. The, the real right. last day the, of the, the last day. of... Uh, yeah, a huge, a huge um, investment deal. Uh, the Biden administration, or the, the incoming Biden administration, obviously was not very happy. The Americans were pushing on human rights issues um, uh, pretty hard, and then all of a sudden the EU, you know, makes this deal with China. Um, I think it's put on the back burner now, or at least it's stalled a bit because of all the, the, the human rights discussions and the sanctions going back and forth. And, and I think officially Valdis Dombrovskis, who is the one in the European Commission responsible for trade, right. said he is not going to push for ratification right. anyway. For anyway. which the European Parliament is, is needed. People like yourself you yeah. still uh, need to ratify this. We need this to team. ratify it, but uh, I think there is also uh, uh, among the different member states. Mm. Uh, so it's not only the, the European right. press, uh, the Parliament, but also right. uh, 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 in in a bigger area. But but uh, um, we uh, uh, also made it clear that there are sanctions against colleagues of mine. Right. Right? Uh, yeah. uh, even the president of the European Parliament is on the uh, uh, sanction list. Sanction list. Yeah. Uh, uh, all because we made a resolution uh, on the human rights situations right. uh, in Xinjiang. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I also, that was quite interesting, I, I was present in this cl behind closed door meeting with the, uh, 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 with the ambassador. The Chinese ambassador the Chambi to the Chinese, EU. Uh, to the EU. Uh, and with every question we asked about human rights, uh, or, or, for instance, uh, uh, what about uh, the International Labour uh, Organization and the uh, core uh, conventions? Uh, uh, around human rights, he, j he just plainly stated, it's, you should not believe what's in the newspapers. Right, right. Uh, this is all fake news. You know about fake news, don't you? So, please don't believe. It's all... No and, and, and that's... Uh, I know the European Commission was uh, very much in favour of this proposal because of the climate targets which is included. Uh, so uh, China promised to uh, be climate neutral in the year 2060. Mm -hmm. 
but all the other things, uh, uh, just promising that you are going to look into the issue of... Wasn't good enough for you. No, no, but, but if you say, I'm, I'm going to look into the yeah. issue of forced labor, uh, but then plainly deny that there is uh, forced labor and that's fake news, that yeah. doesn't... No. So what does, it, what does it tell you, I guess that's a question for all of you, what, what does it tell you about Europe's position towards China and the US? Um, but also maybe about the lack of cooperation between the US and Europe, that at such a, an important time, when, when one, with one outgoing administration in, in Washington and one incoming administration, that Europe goes ahead and, and makes this deal. I mean, um, it, which shows that the US and Europe are in no way, when it comes to China, a front, as perhaps they should be, but or I, not. I think one of the problems is that Europe itself is not a front, because... Of course, Germany uh, really wanted this. And Germany year. really wanted, uh, uh, and in the whole process of ratification, it was then foreseen that it would be ratified uh, around this time next year, right. and was held holding the presidency at that moment, Macron, right. uh, uh, was also in an election campaign, so he, he uh, was uh, also pushing for this. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and uh, I think they uh, took a sprint, but I think the, the sad thing to say is that there is no real European Indian position yeah. uh, 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 in the direction of China. So because if you are in Beijing um, um, and, and you, know, you, you see the rhetoric coming from Washington and then Merkel really pushing this trade deal, you, you get to feel pretty confident or not. In, in a sense that, you know, you can go ahead and deal with, with the EU instead of, that's, that's a lot better than the US and, 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 and Brussels making a united front. Well, I guess two thoughts on this. The, the first one is that there, there is a legacy of the Trump administration in transatlantic relations. And I think one, one way to understand what happened with the comprehensive agreement on investment is a statement that, that whatever you think of that agreement, that Europe can and should take its own position on issues related to China and that it will not just be doing uh, Washington's bidding even under a Biden administration that is right. potentially a, a, better, a better partner. So that, that, you know, that there's a lot of ways in which I think there was um, a lack of, of trust that has continued. So if you're China looking at that, um, I think that's still a work in progress. And, and as you mentioned, within, within Europe itself, um, there's a lot of work to be done on any given China-related issue to create unity. Um, but then when it comes to a broad uh, agenda uh, of potential cooperation between the US and, and Europe, there's still gotta be dealt, that, that, that Trump legacy uh, of, of mistrust has to be dealt with in some concrete way. Mm -hmm. And then the other issue is just what's the role of of business, how do we understand against a broadening background of in Europe of reassessing the relationship with China and saying, well, we can't just have economic cooperation or work together on climate issues. We also need to understand challenges and concerns and security related issues to economic inter interdependence. But there's still uh, important business uh, interests that want to have more access to the Chinese market. Um, and that don't necessarily want a deterioration to the point maybe of US, where US-China relations uh, has, has gone. So there's an important role for business and I think the, the CAI agreement um, sort of highlights that uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has there been, as far as you know, a lot of, I mean, the Americans were surprised about this investment Absol deal. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so it was, too late for them basically to, it was a done deal, it was too late for them to push back. I, I think so, because no one has expected, uh, uh, every attention at that moment was about uh, Brexit, huh? right. uh, 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 also in the whole European policy making, and then all of the sudden there was this uh, um, uh, deal uh, on, the, uh, on the table. I think there is, um, uh, there is also still not very much clarity because, yes, indeed, some business are going to profit from this proposal. Uh, uh, but uh, what does this mean uh, of the, f the former policy uh, of saying uh, uh, we are going to look into state-owned uh, companies who are competing on our uh, market? And, and, and 
Uh, does a deal now may, uh, means that we don't uh, uh, look into that anymore? So also on the business uh, uh, side, there is still not clear who's going to profit, which sectors, which businesses. Uh, I think the German car industry is going to profit, and that's the reason why uh, Merkel uh, uh, was taking this, this quantum leap. But there are also, like, uh, in the whole bicycle, camera, ex there are also... So, so maybe... Um, the, sorry, yeah. There are also sectors who are fear, fearing to lose out with a deal like this. So maybe the EU and the Biden administration, ideally, from a geopolitical point of view, should be more aligned. But, you know, given the fact that Europe is so divided, it, it won't happen. Well, I mean, th there's a lot of um, surprises in this issue that I find frankly, quite surprising. <laughs> First of all, the, the surprise that suddenly there was this trade deal uh, or investment deal where it was a long time in the making. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, that the uh, um, American side was so surprised that Europe would start to act geopolitically on its own, where even though for the entire Trump administration, the buzzword was strategic autonomy from Europe. Sure. And indeed, the new commission said, we're going to be a geopolitical commission. Yeah. The incoming American administration probably thought, you know, once Trump is gone, they'll, yeah. they'll forget about that whole idea. And, 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 that, and that, that was, that's oh, yes. sort of surprising sure. to me. Also because, I mean, the, the, the disparity between the, the Trumpian um, approach to China and the European approach to China doesn't just come from Trump, but from right. a, a fundamentally different geopolitical standpoint. And also, I mean, the third thing that was surprising to be surprising, in my view, is that um, if Europe starts to act more geopolitically, uh, that means that not all member states are created equal. I mean, of course, uh, uh, Paris and Berlin are going to um, uh, uh, run the show yeah. uh, to a certain extent, and and that's um, I mean this is this is Europe coming to terms with the fact that it is already and must start to learn to act like mm -hmm. uh, a power player, right. um, and that's uncomfortable on all kinds of levels. And that's I, I think the last thing that's surprising, um, uh, uh, the fact that we're still surprised that no investment deal or trade deal is going to really change the way the Communist Party is running their country. Right. Um, uh, and and uh, um, I mean that's also a, a difficult thing to come to terms with, mm -hmm. but that's a part of growing up geopolitically. We're not going to change China, but we can, well, negotiate a, um, a not very satisfying investment pact right. on behalf of German business, and that is kind of a win. Right, uh, Mr. Lin, you, you mentioned the Asian partners the U.S. has. You know, the, the most loyal partners: um, Japan, South Korea, come to mind as the most obvious ones. The, the power shifts from Trump to Biden, what does it change for them? And how do the Asian partners of the US look at that power change? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that is a very important question. So, um, I mean, there's the basic recognition. I, I think uh, the power shift has happened, but it's in the sense that there's been a strong continuity, right? So there's, the Biden administration has portrayed itself as basically, you know, continue, continuing the zeitgeist of uh, recognizing a return to great power competition, um, but with the value added of protecting the interest and, and showing more respect to the allies. And the question is whether uh, the Biden administration is able to lay out that vision and that promise in a concrete way. And so there's sort of two critical issues I think the Asians are waiting to hear uh, from the Biden administration. One is how the U.S. envisions the order in Asia and the distribution of the benefits and cost of maintaining that order. And this is something actually uh, Kurt Campbell and Jake Sullivan have written about quite a while back, you know, back in 2019, I think, uh, in foreign affairs to say, you know, to asking the basic question, what is the U.S. competing for and, and what does it really want in the ideal order in Asia? Sullivan, who is now the national security yeah, exactly. advisor. And, right. and, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and the second question is, what is the pathway to pool resources and the political will to achieve that order and to implement specific actions. And so, you know, what is this new ambitious strategy that America is promising the Asians? And I think some of that has to come from a recognition that a lot has happened in the past year and a half, if not more, right? And a lot of these countries have basically taken on uh, autonomous policies and Japan, you know, has, as you know, so being very critical to RCEP as well as to uh, forming new alliances in the region. 
uh, sustaining quad, right? India has been involved in the various aspects. You now, like Australia has a very autonomous policy facing China. And so what the Americans need to do is not to displace them, right? Not to say, okay, here we are back again, right? And now this is what I want you guys to do. That would not work, right? So we, you know, I think the Asians are closely watching that. But what's more important is for the Americans to really recognize and, 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 and to be able to start, I think, a, a, a sort of series of mini lateral discussions. So for example, on issues of semiconductors with Taiwan, Japan, you know, Singapore, on biochemical and medical supplies, you know, India is important. On Arctic issues, right? And that's something I think really important for the Japan and, and Koreans are, you know, observers in the Arctic Council. And in the Antarctic, you know, you have Australia, New Zealand, are big players there. So different countries could contribute to the so-called rules-based order in Asia, which America keeps promising. Right? This is something that we're striving for. But no one really agrees on what that means. And in fact, it suggests that there isn't a rules-based order, apart from the fact it's, it suggests some sort of you know, better solution um, to counter the Chinese rise. And, and that's not adequate at all. Mm -hmm. So there will be many rules that need to be set. And I think that uh, the, the, the Asians would like to work with the, the United States to, to begin to just, you know, start a conversation on how they can play into setting these rules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let, let me stay with you uh, while we talk about uh, uh, Taiwan. Um, mm. I, I read a, an op-ed or an essay by Peter Beinart in, in the New York Times, and he writes, I think a couple of days ago, Biden's policy toward Taiwan is meaningfully increasing the risk of world war. Um, Biden invited a Taiwanese delegation to his inaugural. The Democrats removed the phrase One China from their party platform. And Barnard says this infuriates, infuriates China and it's, it's a needless provocation. It's, it's reckless, um, which was a pretty strong assessment to me. Is he right? Um, no, I'll have to say it's not. Um, and I guess just to go back to a bigger point, right? Um, so uh, the things I've said just now is that if America were to portray itself as having this great new strategy that everyone needs to line up with, then what it's likely to provoke is exactly this type of reaction that, you know, here you come again, you know, this hegemonic you know, power and what you are putting us in sort of in, in the harm's way, right? You're forcing secondary powers to face, to take these risks um, as part of your offshore balancing strategy. So I, I think what's important is that uh, the United States need to lay out, you know, what is the objective and what are the pathways to working together to, on that. Now with Taiwan, it's obviously very tricky, but Trump started this sort of relaxation of official positions to a Taiwan and recognition of, you know, and then starting to have these informal, uh, escalating informal exchanges. Uh, Biden administration is doing more of that. Uh, I think in general, whether, uh, China would respond to it and increase the risk of war is not really in these sort of incidences or frequency of incidences, but in its fundamental interest to start a war at this point. And I do tell, you know, in a slightly glib way to tell um, my students that, well, the biggest reason why China hasn't sort of taken over Taiwan is TSMC. Now, this is completely obviously, you know, it's more of a thought-provoking point than a reality. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that there is still a great deal of economic and technological dependence between Taiwan and, and China. And China, one thing that's been proven in the past year and a half is that the Chinese are having a problem, you know, struggling to uh, uh, fulfill their promise that, you know, any kind of decoupling would just make China stronger because they will turn more inwards to their technological innovations. Well, that hasn't happened mm -hmm. for microchips. Right? So they are still highly dependent on TSMC and other companies to supply them with high-end uh, chips. And this is one of the reasons why you know, China is not in, I mean, it, it's not in its economic interest to have this kind of war. Um, so the increasing presence of uh, U.S. officials or you know, ex-retired officials is not going to fundamentally change that equation. Mm -hmm. And to, rec to, to claim that this will increase the risk of war is more indicative of people not really understanding, you know, where is this going? Is this simply a sort of, you know, U.S. trying to uh, basically essentially offend the Chinese in hope that, you know, the Chinese will back off on other issues? I mean, that's all completely nebulous. Right. So once that has been defined, then uh, I think the goal will be uh, more acceptable, I think. Yeah. Were you surprised, um, Matt, about Biden's um, approach towards Taiwan and, and the things I just mentioned? 
closer cooperation, you know, having a, a Taiwanese delegation in your, in your in our, our inauguration? I think there's been a number of issue areas where there may have been the sense that the Biden administration may change course uh, from, from Trump policies in some sense, but there has been a sort of a continuation of them, at least in the ability to portray them as the U.S. continuing to be hard-nosed. Um, there's a lot of domestic pressure for the administration to make it appear uh, that they are not giving in in any way, shape, or form, or moving away from that tougher uh, approach of, of the Trump administration. But not moving Yet away real, from it is but, something else than you but know, also, a little extra. But also trying to come up with, A, a coherent strategy, because they came in saying, well, the Trump policies were failures on X, right. Y, and Z, and too provocative. So I think the Kunshin's point that it's one thing to come in and say, oh, we're going to have a new strategy, and we're going to make everyone happy with us, and we're just going to be so much better than, than the previous administration, but then not having clarity against that background is potentially the, de the, the destabilizing issue here of just not being able to come up with a, a clear pathway mm. forward. So it's not all that surprising that they would continue to at least portray the policy as one of, sort of solidarity mm. with Taiwan and not in any way, shape, or form backing down to uh, Chinese bullying. Um, but on the other hand, do we actually have a coherent policy in place yet? Um, I think not. The domestic pressure you mentioned on the Biden administration when it comes to Taiwan, who does that I mean, I think from? it's just in general. Yeah. Um, I, I think sure. specifically on Taiwan, I don't know. No. But in general, I think, this is, I think, I think this is, 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 is very real for the Biden team. And I don't know where they would have gone on any given issue area that's different from where they are now. But I think they feel this intensely. And you saw this with all of the, the, the hearings in the Senate for Biden's appointees. Um, being asked first and foremost about what their position on China is going to be, whether or not their portfolio really is related right. to it or not. But there is intense pressure politically and in going into the next election cycle uh, for the Biden administration uh, to portray itself as continuing to be tough. And I think this factors into some of these Taiwan policies, uh, but also trying to make sure, like having creating a little bit of space for reasonableness and knowing that this is a highly sensitive a potentially very risky situation, but also needing to portray yourself as, as tough. Is this another issue with Taiwan, but also Tibet and Hong Kong, all these issues where, where you, can, can the EU be more than, than a bystander in, in this sense? Um, they could be, uh, uh, if uh, indeed there would be a common position, but I think uh, we, we analyzed just before that um, uh, that's in general uh, difficult uh, uh, at the EU level in foreign policy. Uh, so it's, it's not only on China, but especially in China, uh, um, because there are indeed, uh, uh, on the one hand, winners and losers, uh, which are not, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, uh, all even divided uh, sure. around the table. Of course, it's true there are larger member states and smaller uh, uh, member states, and uh, uh, using the phrase of uh, uh, the being the geopolitical uh, commission uh, sounds nice, but is not uh, uh, anywhere near a real uh, a strategy at the uh, European uh, at the European level. Uh, then, uh, of course, you can say uh, uh, you cannot perhaps uh, um, uh, change China through uh, a trade deal. Mm. Uh, but if you have no answer uh, uh, on how else you are going to address the human rights issues, uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, as, an, uh, as an issue, it, it's so the crackdown of the opposition on Hong Kong was only yeah. a few days after the signing of this. Uh, 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 yeah, so th th there, there seems to be, uh, if you have the idea of uh, let's put them together on the table and then there is some uh, sense, uh, uh, I, I think the, there was a clear signal uh, from uh, from the Chinese side uh, uh, that they don't give a damn uh, uh, about Europeans' opinions uh, uh, on uh, uh, on human rights, and and that makes it difficult uh, on our side because I think it's also 
So are we taking a very firm stand uh, to Bangladesh, saying uh, all your uh, uh, garment uh, sector should be compliant right. with the international trade rules, uh, uh, international labor rules, mm -hmm. and look away from China? That's also not a very comfortable position for uh, from the European perspective. So. But uh, there is a couple of very, I think, specific areas where um, and also the EU, not just member states, but the EU could um, uh, not just work with Taiwan, but learn a lot from Taiwan. So, uh, for instance, colleagues of mine do great work on EU-Taiwan uh, digital connectivity, all kinds of aspects related to the technological economy that indeed have geopolitical significance, um, uh, but uh, because um, the EU isn't um, maybe... Uh, as of now fit to uh, coordinate geopolitical or, or indeed defense policy towards Taiwan. It could engage far more with Taiwan on this digital connectivity, for instance. A thing I'm very much interested in, in is um, Taiwan has been battling and dealing with Chinese disinformation for a long time. Um, this is going to be a real issue for uh, European countries as well, and indeed it is already an issue for many European countries. We have very little ways of dealing with that, mm -hmm. and especially ways to deal with that that really suit our open society. Um, well, Taiwan's been uh, uh, battling with that and innovating on that front uh, for years, so, so um, let's not only think about how can we defend Taiwan, but what, how can we learn for, from Taiwan and therefore also uh, give it the place it deserves in, 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 um, you know, in cooperation, uh, diplomatic cooperation in, in those areas. Right. Let, let, let's, um, because we've talked about how the U.S. looks at, at, at China and the other way around, obviously, uh, the, the power change from Trump to, to Biden. You, you wrote a book about Xi Jinping. Yep. Uh, let, let's not psychologize too much, but, but how does he look at the U.S.? currently, coming out of the COVID crisis in a, in a worse shape, I guess, than, than China? Yeah, so an interesting um, man behind uh, uh, the, the speeches and the rhetoric of Xi Jinping is Wang Huning, and he's a um, uh, chief propagandist in the, uh, uh, in the CCP establishment, who's actually written a couple of books when he was still an academic on uh, American society. He was a great student of Alexis de Tocqueville, other French philosophers. Um, and we see from that sort of, that part of the party coming a very um, a, a strong voice that, you know, America in, a, in essence is, is a society in decline. It's crippled by division. Um, it's uh, unable to get um, uh, coordinated strong policies for national goals and order. Um, so I think that's a very strong, that, that sort of myth of decline, uh, of decay, uh, is, is very much alive in, in, in that part of the, the CCP and its view on, and on the US. And he has Xi Jinping's ear. Yes, he's the chief propagandist right. of, of Xi Jinping and indeed a very, and his, his, his chief cyber security or cyberspace uh, administrator, very influential voice in shaping the, the narrative of Xi Jinping and, and China. Um, and I think actually what, what may be the most threatening uh, thing to that narrative uh, from a Chinese point of view is the strides that Biden is making in actually getting uh, all kinds of um, national policy goals in order, getting uh, uh, um, uh, uh, stimulus packages and right. financing for, for a, a, a fairly fundamental reorientation of the American economy. It's a surprise to the Chinese as well. I think so, especially after Trump. But in, I think broader, um, it's, it, I mean, if Biden can get that done, it's, it's, uh, it might be the most important geopolitical thing he can do, even though it's not, in a sense, geopolitical mm. um, a policy at all. Because what is the takeaway that China, uh, what does China take away from that? Well, that, 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 that myth of decay exactly. that it is trying to sell about, that it in part believes in itself and is certainly trying to sell t to the rest of the world about America and about the West, about us as well. Um, isn't so isn't so easy to sell at all because Biden is is proving otherwise. Yeah, for for now, Mr. Lin, do you think China has ever been as as confident when it comes to dealing with the U.S. as it is right now? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting um, what Thais has just said. Um, another very influential person, perhaps not as influential in a very direct way as Wang Huning is, um, you know, some of the leading academics. Uh, so, for example, uh, Yan Xuetong. So Yan Xuetong at Tsinghua University, right, he, a few years back, if you might remember, he uh, came up with the idea uh, that what China's foreign policy principle should be uh, based on the idea of a more sort of a, a moral realism, right, and in which the moral part 
is China's more superiority to the you know decadent American capitalist. And the the realist part is that China should recognize that um, essentially that U.S. and China should stop being friends, pretending to be friends. Actually, that's very important, pretending to be friends. Mm -hmm. So what uh, Yan Xuetong's uh, diagnosis at that point, uh, and, and this was the time when Xi Jinping was really trying to establish, you know, and then create his own line on foreign policy, the assertiveness sort of uh, direction. And what he was saying is simply that for too long, the Americans and the Chinese have looked at each other and pretended that they could be friends. <laughs> and that sets up all sorts of false expectations and disappointments. Mm -hmm. So what the Chinese should really do, and the Americans should just get back to the fact that you know they are they will be irreconcilable interests, and there will be a few pragmatic areas for corporations, and they should work on that basis, very much as the Soviet Union and the, uh, the Americans did back in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And so I think some of that perspective is out still out there, and furthermore, I I mean for my sort of issue area specialization, I've been looking at maritime conflicts and maritime law. Um, Certainly, the Chinese take away a lot from sort of ideas of Mahan and even Grotius, right? You know, uh, and um, these ideas continue to influence Chinese thinking. So it's not just a matter of um, you know the, the traditional cultural understanding or uh, communist you know thoughts. They they cross fertilize with a lot of the latest ideas, concepts, and these are things that's you know worth paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And if I may just very quickly come back to uh, Tyson Agnes's point earlier. Please. I think one way to defend ourselves, or to, to sort of demonstrate to the Chinese that democracy is not entirely in decay, is actually to work on issues of academic freedom mm -hmm. and civil society, right? So in Cambridge and around the universities over the past year, we've been discussing how we can shelter our students from discussions on Hong Kong, right, with the national security law being you know, sort of hanging over our heads. And in terms of civil society, uh, next month, there will be a weaker uh, tribunal uh, run entirely sponsored by civil society and, and formed by a panel of you know non-China specialists to really look at you know whether um, according to international law that China has violated uh, or met the criteria of genocide and all these things are not done by the government it's done by institutions and private you know individuals and organizations mm -hmm. and that's the sort of power of democracy that we need to continue to um, encourage. Yeah. Yeah. Does the Western one more point, and then we go, go to Matt. The, 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 the Western point, all, all the criticism on about the human rights issues, where human rights obviously has a different definition in in, in China than it, than it does here, uh, but also the criticisms of lack of press freedom, civil society, etc. It doesn't seem to hurt China yet. They don't seem to care, or do they? Is that criticism that actually? Um, they just brush off, or is it something that, you know, hurts them a bit in a sense? Mr. Lin, or anybody, basically. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I mean, first of all, it, it, it's becoming hard to see today um, due to the increasing state control over discourse, both academic and popular. But now prior to, I mean, a, a decade ago, say, um, there was significant discussion of these issues within China among academics and others. Um, it, it, I don't think all these sort of strands of thinking have died out entirely. So uh, all the sort of connections that China has built through its massive proliferation of NGOs on, on various issues, you know, like environment, gender, and all that, do have feedback effects into domestic discourses, at least in the past. Now, so we, what we don't know is whether, you know, under Xi Jinping's rule, that a lot of that space has been closed up, and, and I'm sure Dias and Matt will be better you know, informed than I, mm -hmm. but um, when you talk about whether it has an effect, well, no, not on policymakers, whether it has a more broader effect on our popular resistance or people's expectation, sure it does. Yeah, and it's, I think, interesting to add to that, that in the latest five-year plans, when they were presented just, I mean, very recently, uh, not only was the sort of security part a lot bigger than before, but ideological security, meaning protection of the Chinese nation from all these um, invasive um, weaponized concepts um, coming from the West, was put uh, uh, was given a far more pro pro prominent place. So, so I mean, uh, I I completely agree with Professor Lin that that you know those other strands in Chinese society and thought haven't died out. Um, but Xi Jinping is certainly um, very much sort of gearing up for protecting China and Chinese discourse far more against, you know, what he sees as, as real threats. Mm 
um, uh, yeah, so, so I think that, that sort of anxiety, that paranoia maybe even uh, about Western concepts and Western norms is, is, is uh, I mean, easily forgotten, but it's, it's very central to, to, to Chinese policy making. Mm. Great. Be before we go to a few questions from the audience, I think, Matt, you wanted to add something. Just yeah, just to jump in on a couple of issues that Kunshin and, and I have mentioned is, is that, I, so I worked in the international relations department under Yen Shui Tong for almost a decade, oh, he was my, my boss. Um, and so just the, the ability to be in the room with him and my Chinese colleagues on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, and talking with students, there was a reality and a complexity to the debates that they had, to the way that they navigated the, the complexities prior to to Xi Jinping, but also afterwards. And I was able to, to see that, to understand it, to try to engage mm -hmm. with it. And all of that now, that kind of an opportunity, I think to have that kind of a position would, would be really difficult now. Mm -hmm. um, we have a general difficulty with academic exchange, with, um, with scholarly exchange that I think then feeds into some of the, the tensions, the misunderstandings on the US-China level, but also that are, that are real um, in, in the European relationship with China too. And I think this is something maybe looking at the Biden administration, we may start to see a change just because of the end of the coronavirus um, or it, it, the ability to restart some of those academic exchanges. The Trump administration had also really politicized mm -hmm. those. There's still a lot of concern about Chinese potentially uh, wielding influence in U.S. Uh, universities with provision of grants uh, or Confucius Institutes or, or whatever. But I do think there will be a restarting of some of this person-to-person -person exchange, but I don't think that, that will be restarted in the same way on the Chinese side. Right. Um, so this is just to say that there's something really important lost yep. when we don't have that ability to see more of the depth and the complexity for ourselves. Just less understanding. If, yeah. If you, yeah. Let's go to a few questions from, from the audience. Um, the first one is from Joram. He is asking, I, I guess I'll address this question to you first, Agnes. Uh, how, how can Europe work more closely with like-minded countries in Asia in approaching China? Um, um, uh, that also uh, makes it uh, a prerequisite that we are having a, a, a China uh, strategy. And a common European strategy. A, a common uh, European strategy, and, and uh, there is uh, indeed uh, work in this, uh, uh, in this field. To be uh, to be done, uh, and uh, uh, for instance, uh, you see that uh, from the New Zealand side. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. You don't consider that Asia, uh, perhaps, but uh, they say. Uh, oh, no, I do. Uh, okay, uh, uh, they said uh, uh, to us. Uh, uh, we thought the most progressive trade deal at the moment you can make with the uh, New Zealand uh, 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 government. So let's see if we can have some common uh, uh, conversation and then a common approach. And they said, please join, uh, uh, join us in, uh, uh, in, in dealing together mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the Chinese. So they are very much uh, a progressive government, very much in favor of the European Union making a trade deal uh, uh, with the Chinese, because then we could work together uh, from different directions. Uh, um, and, and that's could be a way of uh, uh, moving uh, uh, forward. I think more cooperation through trade deals with yeah, nations. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there's another question from. Oh, you want to add uh, something, Professor Lin? Go Which ahead. Just very quickly, uh, exactly Please. on Agnes's point. Um, since you mentioned New Zealand, so Taiwan has a major trade agreement, right? The NSTEC with New Zealand and a separate customs you know, right. uh, union kind of thing. So this is something that's actually informing some policy debates in India as well, hmm. uh, whether India can establish that kind of ship, uh, relationship with Taiwan as well. So uh, these are the kind of creative solutions. I think I very much agree with Agnes. Yeah. Great. Um, second question is from Onur. I hope I um, don't mispronounce his name. Um, is there a possibility of a long-term cooperation between the e EU and China on the matter of global warming? despite of the human rights issues uh, China has? Uh, is, 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 it's a good question. The, the human rights issues, Xinjiang, et cetera, 
Um, does that block any other progress when it comes to climate change? Uh, I would hope. Uh, I would hope not, uh, because in practice. Uh, in, in, in practice, I think there is a matter of urgency to deal the uh, to deal with the climate issue uh, on a global scale. And the professor mentioned uh, the contribution of China uh, uh, to the whole uh, uh, CO2 uh, emissions. Twenty-seven percent, or what? Uh, Twenty-seven percent. You, you, you mentioned so. So uh, if if there you can uh, build an alliance uh, in working both uh, on, let's say the 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 the, the, the Paris uh, targets. Mm -hmm. I think that would be helpful. And that's for. I think that's in the making. Uh, uh, that's at, all within the framework of the Paris Agreement. Um, uh, yeah, and, but, but uh, I think it's now for the first time that the Chinese are putting this uh, 2060 uh, uh, a year on the table uh, of reaching the climate neutral uh, uh, goal. Uh, and, and, and this is, you could say, okay, Europe is trying to uh, uh, be a little bit faster, but uh, it's the first time they made this commitment um, um, uh, and I, I hope we can work uh, on that. I also hope we can solve the human rights issue. But uh, but, but the human rights issues, if, if the trade agreement is stalled, then that has everything to do with the human rights discussion absolutely. and the sanctions back and forth. So the human rights discussion can stop the trade agreements in its tracks, but not so much climate, you say. That's, that's, I, I, that's I, another track. I, I really do hope that it's not going to stop uh, uh, the uh, cooperation on climate issues. It's, it's interesting to look at, for instance, uh, surveys done amongst European citizens, and especially young European citizens. And um, um, for instance, a while ago, the European Council on Foreign Relations did that. And, and um, many of the sort of young European citizens point out that there's too big um, uh, security or, or big issues that they, that, that they worry about, first of all, climate change, and second of all, the rise or, and, and threat of China and Russia. Um, it's going to be increasingly complicated for business elites, for governments, for parliaments, um, to explain to, uh, 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 to, to European citizens, to electorates, that um, you know, on the one hand, there's this drastic, uh, uh, very rapidly worsening image of China because of all, all of these very pressing human rights violations and political issues in China itself. And on the other hand, um, uh, we have to s keep working together on all sorts of issues, and right. most of all climate change. I mean, this is going to be a very painful split in, in European politics, um, and that's going to be getting increasingly harder to explain. I mean, especially the Netherlands, uh, people are thinking so much worse about China very quickly. Um, uh, but you know all these areas of cooperation are still on the table, and and I do worry that if the political sentiments keeps uh, uh, keeps developing the way it does now, um, mm -hmm. that's that's not going to be a, a position that that can be you know uh, um, uh, kept for very long. That that the anti-China sentiment will will get, uh, gather such strength that mm -hmm. um, well, anyway. So I think it's not that easy. Uh, just looking at the interest sentiments, and especially popular sentiments, play a big role in this. But it, it will not be easy. But uh, trying to solve the climate issue without yeah. China is also no, uh, it's, quite it's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah, you know, I completely agree. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Our third question: um, What will be the effects of China's effort to become more self-reliant technologically uh, for the U.S.-China and the EU-China relationship? What, what, yeah, what will be the effects of China's effort to become more self-reliant technologically? Um, for the U.S.-China, EU-China relationship? Anybody? I think one uh, uh, effect, um, and, and Professor Lin already pointed toward that, is that it's turning sort of the European and the American view on, on um, economic and industrial policy uh, uh, on its head. So um, the, the fact that we start thinking about now, uh, about protecting certain, certain areas um, of high tech or uh, uh, from chi competition with China, or indeed that ASML, a Dutch company, is being pressured not to sell um, uh, their machines uh, to Chinese markets. Um, that's, that's already, I mean, we're getting used to it already, but that's quite new. That is, and that's gonna continue for a, a, a while still, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Does anybody want the final word before we end this lively discussion? Anything to add from Cambridge? If not, I'd like to thank everybody for um, uh, being here today to dig a little deeper into the um, uh, transatlantic and the EU-China relationship. Um,
that's it. I, I guess we can talk for another few hours. Uh, thanks to uh, Professor Lin as well in, uh, in Cambridge. Thanks so much. Uh, to Thies Dan, so obviously to Matt Furchin and Agnes Jongerius. Uh, thank you, everybody. There you are. Uh, for watching at home, um, there's more also about China coming up in the next few weeks, I think. But look at our website on May 27. There's an evening about the Uyghurs and Xinjiang. But check thebali.nl. Um, for the exact date and time and uh, obviously hope to see you again in a few weeks or months maybe in person in the Bali. Thanks for watching.